Well, Judges chapter 4 is going to be a very interesting chapter to discuss. we got some unique things to learn that should, there are still challenges that we have today. So I wanted to get in and discuss some of these things. Uh, in this chapter, we learn about Deborah. Okay, in order, now we know traditionally that uh, it has been said that uh, when ancient writings were written, they had a tendency to not put women in there or their perspectives in there. Uh, we know they were there, they had, uh, they had opinions, they had ideas, but they weren't seen as valuable, as valuable as the men's, as according to ancient times. Um, but sometimes women were put into ancient records if they had a significant role that they played in society. Deborah is going to be one of these women. We're going to learn a little bit about her today. Uh, she's a prophetess. She judges Israel. She and Barak deliver Israel from the Canaanites. Jael, a woman, slays Sisera, the Canaanite. So there's two women that we get to see and understand more about in this chapter. So verse 1, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Now remember from the last chapter, Ehud was the uh, leader, the judge that was raised up. God's, okay, they're repentant. We need someone to help them to learn the law, to learn the commandments. So Ehud is who God chose to do that. He led them for a while. He dies, of course, and Israel goes bad again. Israel is has this classic problem of faith in a leader, but not faith in themselves. So a big challenge that they have is they when they have great leaders, they do well because they believe the leader, but they have a hard time when they're on their own because they don't believe in themselves enough. They don't have faith in themselves to do what God needs done uh, to, so they can work with God directly. Uh, and that's the point of the gospel is to help us to get to that point where we have faith in Christ ourselves. And that is what motivates us. It's not faith in somebody else, faith in Christ not another human, basically. So verse two, the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Hazor Harosheth of the Gentiles. So there's still, remember, there are still some people that were left in, in the land of Canaan, this promised land. They, the the, the, the uh, Israelites did not get rid of everybody. Uh, more from what we understand was their choice. They're like, well, okay, fine. We're not going to kill you. We'll, we'll deal with you guys in a different way uh, or things like that. So God uses them as a tool to humble Israelites, not unlike the Lamanites were in the Book of Mormon. So uh, they are now, Jabin, king of Canaan, comes in, takes them over basically, and uh, Israel is put in bondage, basically. So verse three, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron and 20 years, he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So 20 years, he basically, what they're saying is he had lots and lots of military weapon advantage and he oppressed mightily, didn't just oppress, but mightily oppressed for 20 years, it says here. So they lived under the rule of this guy and uh, probably put onerous taxes on them and all kinds of challenges and things and changed their laws to way, the way he wanted them, favored him, not them, punished them for different things, all kinds of stuff's going on that they felt, man, this guy's like oppressing us, probably pushing their religion down, other things like that, and enriching himself in the, in the process. So the children are, of Israel are, they're upset. They are just distraught. Finally, they're humbled. Now they're praying to God for help. They're praying to God to get assistance and to help. They're remembering God again. So verse four, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Now, this is an important thing because we are learning about a woman who is a prophetess. Now, some people might say, that cannot be. You have to have the priesthood to be a prophet. That prophet is a priesthood calling. Uh, and so you have to have that calling in order to be the prophet. So 
uh, and be a leader of Israel. Now, here's the thing to understand, okay, is you have to understand how they're using the word prophetess, okay? They're not saying she was called like Moses or Joshua. They're not saying she had the priesthood. They're saying she has the gift of prophecy, which is a gift of the Spirit, not something you have to have the priesthood to have. To have the calling of a prophet of God in the priesthood, you know, the, the high priest, that is a priesthood calling. But to have the ability to prophesy, to be close to the Spirit and have the Spirit help you learn the future events, that is a gift of the Spirit which does not require that uh, priesthood. In fact, uh, uh, jo let's see, this is uh, James E. Talmadge, Articles of Faith. Also, you can see uh, Joseph Fielding Smith's Answers to Gospel Questions book to get more on this. They, he says, no special ordination in the priesthood is essential to man's receiving the gift of prophecy. Bearers of the Melchizedek priesthood, like Adam, Noah, Moses, and a multitude of others were prophets but not more truly so than others who were specifically called to the Aaronic order, as exemplified in the instance of John the Baptist. He was Aaronic priesthood, not Melchizedek priesthood. The ministrations of Miriam and Deborah show that this gift may be possessed by women also. So can women have the gift of prophecy? Can they foresee things that are coming? Yes. Now we have to understand here too is there is a lack of leadership inside Israel. So they're not being led by a prophet. They're not being led by someone who's communing with God. They have all gone bad. They all went wicked. They lost that opportunity. Now they're starting to pray and get it back, but they're not there yet. So Deborah, who has a natural gift given to her from the spirit to prophesy, is helping them. And so they're asking her to help them basically is what it comes down to because they don't have the leadership in place. So she's the next best opportunity in there because we don't have the leadership and the priesthood going at this time, basically. Uh, so the thing to understand here is can women contribute into the church organization? Can women and their insights be very valuable into what goes on within, whether it's a ward or a stake or the church or anything? Absolutely. Can they receive gifts? Can they receive information from God that can help and encourage and improve the rest of the church? Yes. That doesn't mean they supersede the prophet. When a prophet is called, when the priesthood is in place, then there is a clear understanding of who gets what and can move forward as far as the administration of the church. That does not negate anybody in the church getting their own revelations and even understanding some things. So, the gifts of the Spirit are different from holding the priesthood. Very important distinction to make. So let's get in and learn more about what Deborah does here. Verse 5, And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So they're coming to her saying, We need help. We need understanding, basically. We need to know where we stand with God and what's going on basically here. So verse 6, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinom, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? And I, So she's reminding them of something that God had said before, basically. Verse 7, I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So now she's she's saying basically, okay, this is what I need you to do, and here's how it's going to work. So she's prophesying. She's in helping them, through her spiritual gift, understand what they need to do. Okay, I, And again, her having a spiritual gift does not negate the need for the priesthood and a prophet, and having a priesthood and a prophet does not negate her gift of the Spirit either. They work together, which is very important to understand. It's not a one or the other. It's it's both is fine. Um, okay, so she's prophesied. If you go this way, if you do this, we will. He the God's going to deliver the uh, king into your hands and his army, and then you're going to win. 
So verse 8, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So he's saying, Okay, you're telling me this. I'm not going to go, though, until you come with me. That's Part of that could be a lack of faith on Barak's part to say, Okay, I'm not... Uh, I want to believe you, but I don't fully believe you kind of a thing with, with Deborah. Um, and another one could be that because he sees in her this opportunity to commune with God, he wants, he wants to know that God's on their side. So he wants this woman who's telling them this, who has this connection to God to be with them. Uh, so it could go either way on that. Now verse nine, and she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So they're going to pull this. They're going to capture the king and his army, basically. And they're going to win. But Sisera, okay, he's the, he's the chief captains of the military for the king. And he is a hard person to deal with. He's very good at what he does. So he's a hard opponent. And so the Lord is going to... Get Sisera pushed off to the side, basically. Verse 10, And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. Those are the tribes. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Kenite. Okay, and remember Kenites. Uh, just a, a quick footnote on this. Okay, and you can look up Judges 1.16 to, for reference. The Kenites are the descendant of Jethro. Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. He is a part of the tribe of Israel that didn't stay in slavery in Egypt. Whether they broke off before they went in, whether they uh, left, fled Egypt, snuck out, and got out of Egypt, uh, we don't know for sure. But they are connected together, basically. They're kind of a part of the, a part of the family of Israel, but not necessarily the literal children of Israel in, in a way. Okay, so Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had served himself from the Kenite, severed himself from the Kenites, and pitched his tent in unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. So this man Heber is not far from where all this is going to happen, how things are working out. So verse 12, they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinom, uh, was gone up to Mount T Tabor. So they went, oh, look, Barak has gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera's like, oh, okay. So verse 13, and Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. So he's like, oh, look, we have a chance here to, to do something. So Sisera is getting ready to fight, thinking he's got an, an opportunity to get an advantage here. Verse 14, And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. So Sisera's got his army. He's like, oh, look, Barak, he's the, he's the guy that we need to take out because he's kind of the military leader for Israel, it, it seems like. So we're going to go out and take him. Well, what they didn't realize is Barak was prepared for it. He was ready. Uh, so it didn't go so well. Verse 15, and the Lord discomfited Sisera or put him to flight, got him scared. They're finally, oh, rats, we're, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. So it was so crazy, so much chaos that happened, Sisera thought, we got a chance to take an opportunity here. And it turned into, we are being ambushed, surprised, caught completely off guard. We were not ready to fight a whole nother 10,000 against 10,000. We thought we'd have a huge competitive advantage and we don't. So we got to get out of here. If we're going to save, save us and preserve our army, we got to get out of here. So it was so crazy that even Sisera got off his chariot and left on foot. Could be his chariot was it was damaged in the whole process. A uh, problem happened with it. Maybe there was lots of just a log jam of chariots and horses and things going on. 
And so he just had to, in, in order to get away, the chariot was slowing him down because of the log jam. So he had to get off and run. There's lots of different things that could have happened that would um, encourage Sisera to get off his chariot, which would be a faster way to get out of there and run on foot. Apparently running, on, running away on foot was the more advantageous way that he believed to get out of there and save his life. So there was a reason that there, the advantage of the chariot was no longer there because of that, the ambush from the Israelites, basically. Verse 16, But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harosheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So the 10,000 that Sisera brought were wiped out. It was that crazy, just going after them, just taking the fight right to them constantly, even as they're trying to run away, we're keeping up with them. And even though they had chariots, which means they have horses, Israel was keeping up with them. So maybe Israel had horses as well, just not chariots, or had a way to disable chariots or deal with them where they could get them. Now, Sisera, he fled. He got off his chariot and left. So he was able to get out of the way and to not be slain with the general population of his army. So verse 17, how be it Sierra fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. So Heber and his family were, were just happened to be in the area, according to themselves. They're like, oh, we're in this area. There's this great fight going on. Holy cow. Sisera finds his way to Heber's house. He gets in there and uh, is probably trying to hide, basically, uh, so that's where, that's where this is at. There's probably no coincidence that Heber was there because of how the situations are going to work out and the prophecy. Uh, but, uh, so let's read on to learn more. Verse 18, and Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, turn in my Lord, turn in to me, fear not. Basically saying you're safe here. Okay, come on, let's get you inside. You're okay. You're, you're safe here. Uh, and when he had turned in unto her, into the tent. So this is, so Jael is Heber's wife and she's like, come in, not Heber saying this, but Jael's, Jael saying this, uh, turned her into the tent. She covered him with a mantle. Now, if you look on the footnote there, a Hebrew word is a rug or thick covered or blanket. So she's trying to conceal him basically. Verse, verse 19. And he said unto her, give me, I pray thee a little water to drink for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. So he's like, oh, thank you so much. But can I get some water, get some water or something? So she gave him a little bit of milk uh, and then covered him up. In verse 20, and he said unto her, stand in the door of the tent. And it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, is there any man here? Thou shalt say no. So he's he's like, go, go to the door and tell it, you know, pretend no one's here, basically. Um, verse 21, then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail out of the tent and took a an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. So there's more to this story than we're getting at this point, but just give you an idea. Okay. She took a nail of the tent. So when they built these tents, they were, they didn't have spring bar tents or these cool tents we have today that are self-supporting. They have pole tents. So you have these poles that are vertical, but in order to hold that vertical, you know, it, it needs to make sure it can't go in any direction. So to prevent the tent from tipping in any direction, they tied the ends of it down. So they had these long stakes, we would call them basically, big long stakes. So this is probably a foot long. It says in here, they called it a nail of the tent, but this is like a foot long stake at least, if not longer, that's driven into the ground that you tie the tent off to. So the tent supports itself by pulling in every direction. So she goes and gets one of these stakes and apparently Sisera falls asleep and he is uh, uh, asleep under the blankets. Basically, he's probably tired from the stress and the running and the battles and things. He was thirsty, get some water, oh, I can relax and rest. And uh, he falls asleep. So she comes in and basically literally nails him to the ground, runs his stake through his temples. Now the temples are right here. 
So this went right through his brain, basically, just, just right there, basically, just kind of a behind and above the eyes a little bit, right through his brain. Um, and, and it says, fastened it unto the ground. So it was not just, bam, hit, you know, pop into his head. She pounded it through his head, out the other side, and into the ground. Why would she do this? Okay, it tells us a couple chap, a couple verses earlier, excuse me, that Heber had no beef with Jabin, the king of the Canaanites. They were on good ground. Um, we don't know exactly. Could there have been past experiences or bad blood that got into this? Um, maybe. Could it be that they sided with Israel and they didn't like what Canaan was doing against Israel because they're cousins, distant cousins to Israel? Maybe, maybe she sided with Israel and decided, you know, I'm just going to get rid of you. This is what I'm, this is, you know, these are my, you're fighting my cousins and you're trying to destroy my cousins. So that's my kin. So I'm going to, I'm going to fight you. And she just thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to just get this guy out of the way without a hassle. That is possible. Could it be Sisera was a bit belligerent or with JL or tried to, more things than he should have with her? I don't know. That technically is a possibility, but we don't know. I would probably say more than likely, JL and Heber decided we're siding with Israel and you're the enemy of our friend, so we're gonna kill you. We're gonna just off you and make this easier for our, our uh, friends. Uh, verse 22, and behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, JL came out to meet him and said unto him, come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. When he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So Israel's now finally, things are starting to go better for them. They're probably still in a repentance and probably going, oh, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. We will, we'll, we're trying to be better Okay, and Deborah helped them because Deborah had these gifts of the Spirit. Okay, all of us have gift, at least one gift of the Spirit. And as we come closer to the Spirit, we can learn about what those gifts are and how can we use those to further the Lord's work. So you can have more than one gift. You can get them. Uh, if the parable of the talents is a good example of that, that as you develop your current gift, you can get more gifts. Uh, the gift of prophecy is a pretty good gift to have. Uh, and so she was able to use her gift. She, while Israel collectively was not doing the right things, some people in Israel were still doing some things right. And Deborah happened to be one of those people who was able to help them out in this time. So a very important lesson to understand here is that we cannot discount the wisdom and experience of others around us that they can be there to help us in what we're doing as well. So a very important point to look at, uh, make sure that we do not underestimate anybody around us, basically. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next chapter.